This is a production of Cornell University. What's the outline for the talk today? I'm going to give a little bit of background on what's the, the agriculture related environmental pollution and the complexity of, of estimating the right fertilizer end rates for a particular field, basically the background of why the adaptant tool was um, developed. We're going to talk about the tool, discuss its calibration, its validation studies, and I will end with a few applications of adapt N in new environmental policies that we're now promote, promoting. And so, you know, the green uh, uh, revolution, the beginning of the century, really enabled an increase in crop production, and it came with a price. So there's a lot of environmental concerns related to nitrogen, um, uh, nitrogen le leaching from in, uh, agriculture production. First of all, uh, the pr production of the fertilizer is very uh, energy uh, costly. 1% of all the energy in the world is now devoted into producing nitrogen fertilizer. Um, it has groundwater issues, greenhouse gas, and also uh, some health issues related to air pollution. Overall, there's a lot of environmental concerns. And this is the Gulf of Mexico. I'm, I'm Pretty sure you, you all heard of the, of the dead zone, what it's called. Every summer, inputs of, of nutrients from uh, upstream lead to hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. And actually last year, or last summer, was the largest dead zone ever recorded. So in spite of many efforts that has been done, it, it's really hard to, to show progress uh, in this uh, respect. And it's not surprising that the intensity of, of the production upstream is, is overwhelming. So this is the, the land cover uh, map. The, the yellow are corn fields, and green is the soy field, soybean. And this is USDA data, and just the immense on, on the intensity of this uh, system is, is, is amazing. And I want to maybe give a few words about the, the, how we can, uh, uh, or what is currently being done. So this is, this is the rainfall for a location in Iowa, from Des Moines, Iowa. This is the months of the year. So typically, um, corn is planted at, at, at May, harvested about in the fall, in September. And 30% of all U.S. corn growers actually apply their fertilizer in the fall. It's logistically, it's, it's much easier for them. They have time. The season is over. They have time to go in and, 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 and fertilize. But it's very inefficient to fertilize maybe eight months before the crop actually needs it in the next season. So there's a lot of end losses and, and basically inefficiencies. About 60% of farmers apply it in the spring as a pre-plant in the spring, which is better than a fall pre-plant, but still relatively uh, or, or there is some uh, diff or time difference between the, the, the when it, the pre-plant is made and the actual crop uptake in the in the season and another 30 percent or so apply uh, in season so this is the more advanced way of actually supplying your fertilizer close to when the crop needs it and it's more efficient and it adds up to more than 100% because some farmers apply twice, both in the fall and in the spring. And when farmers need to make decisions about their fertilizer end rate, there's a lot of uncertainty involved. And the, the EONR or the optimum end rate uh, is, is very hard to predict. And there's a risk of, if you over fertilize, there's actually lower risk than under fertilizing. And this leads farmers or many farmers to overapply filter, uh, fertilizer just to make sure that they're not and deficient. There's no deficiency of nitrogen. And it's very hard to actually uh, get or understand what is the right end rate to a particular field because soil nitrogen is so dynamic and so valuable. So it, 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 it has many losses pathway in many uh, sources of N inputs. There's organic matter which goes mineralization in the field and a lot of transformation going on in every location in the field and changes in time and in space. 
So it's very hard to understand how much soil you really have in your field, of how much nitrogen you have in your soil. So the, the fertilizer industry has been promoting what they call the 4R concept. Maybe you heard of it. It's basically that farmers should supply their fertilizer in the right source, the right rate, the right time, and the right place. The four R's of nutrient management. As a concept, this is a good concept. It can really advance farmers and to better manage their field. However, it is a lot of, uh, it's very hard to implement this, this concept. So what is the right rate for a specific field? What is the right source? Is it depending on the rate? Is it depending on the time and so on? All of these R's basically interact with each other. So farmers have a, a very difficult times in implementing a full uh, for our approach. And we, in the last few months, we've been developing this conceptual model of how an N rate, a dynamic way to estimate nitrogen uh, fertilizer rate should be. So in each field, the farmer have its resources, the soil type, soil health, the condition of the field, the climate. There are factors which the, the farmer actually control, the hybrid, use of cover crops, yes or no, what are the tillage. And when you need to make a decision about your end rate, you need to know the other four or three hours, the source, the placement, and the timing. And of course, the whole field is, is subjected to weather, the effect of weather, precipitation, temperature, solar radiation, all these things that drive the transformation of nitrogen in the soil. So all these factors, basically continuously interact in space and in time to, to decide or to affect the soil in crop N in any given moment in the field. And you can use external inputs like remote sensing, like soil tests to help and, 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 and basically um, validate or correct your, your estimation of what soil N and crop N uh, in your field, and after you have a good sense of the soil and in crop end, you need to account for the potential. So what, are you, what yield are you expecting in your field? How, what's the potential of, of that specific field? What's the economics? How much did you pay for your grains? How much do you, or you get for your grains? How much you pay for your fertilizer? What's the risk? And in the end, you can estimate the right end rate for a specific location. And this is, of course, a, a very a, a challenging, and we believe that Modeling is a way forward to do that. And, and so when you want to develop a model, the way you do it, you basically you need a lot of field data, which then need to calibrate your model and then validate your model. And if you're happy with the validation, you move on. If not, you go back and you repeatedly collect more data, calibrate and validate. And in the end, you're, you need to have an independent model evaluation uh, after your, 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 you feel it's, it's uh, validated enough. So the adapt N tool uses the precision and uh, precision nitrogen management model, the PNM. It's a model developed here uh, at Cornell by Jeff M. Melkonian. It's a, it's a combination of two different models, a soil chemistry model, Leach N, and a crop growth model, model of Sinclair. So the Leach N does the hydrology and the biogeochemistry of the soil, the, the movement of water, the transformation of carbon and nitrogen. And and that in turn affects the crop or the growth of a crop, which in this case maize, uh, to give a holistic uh, approach to, to modeling the, the, the system. Uh, so you need data to validate the, the model. So we were lucky here, that was before my time, of course, but Cornell was lucky to have the Willsboro Lysimedo Plots Farm. It's a farm uh, close to Lake Champlain near Vermont. It's basically a farm where you have a, a difference in soil textures, and Cornell has installed these extensive lysimeter plots, which allow for to test different soil treatments and collect uh, the drainage and, and the leaching and and and, uh, and then allow a, 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 a extensive testing of, of the model. And so the PNM was validated using uh, this uh, farm. And these are a few of, our, of the results. I will go quickly on that. So this is for nitrate and leaching. Uh, basically a good agreement between simulated uh, and measured nitrate, uh, soil nitrate, uh, or the leached nitrate. 
Uh, this is where another experiment where they had manure replication, which adds complexity to the, to the model, but still the TNM simulated quite nicely with a good agreement uh, between uh, the measured data. The model was also validated for other components like crop N or the yield uh, in, in different um, studies. So overall, the model does a good job in predicting the different uh, components. And that was the, the, the background or, 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 or the PNM was, was, was one of the main, once the, the, the model was validated, um, so in the early 2000s, uh, they came to the understanding that it could be used to predict uh, soil uh, or the, the nitrogen dynamics. So that's how ADAPT-N was born. So what is ADAPT-N? ADAPT-N is a decision support tool to help farmer estimate their soil N in the complex production environment. And it effectively addresses multiple environment, oh, sorry, multiple environmental issues of water quality, the gases losses, greenhouse gas, or ammonia emission and the energy uh, costs. And ADAPTEN was developed as a, pu a public uh, private partnership with a company called uh, ATC, Agronomic Technology Corporation, a startup company uh, which uh, uh, have, have had the license to the, to the model. Uh, and it was commercialized in 2013. And a few months ago, ATC was acquired by Yara. For those who don't know, Yara International is the, the world's largest fertilizer production company. It works in 160 countries. And they uh, saw the potential in the tool and they um, will invest further and, 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 and keep on developing uh, the tool for other crops and other locations. And this is maybe the time to, to just to disclose that Yara uh, supports some of the research of uh, adapt and here at this uh, in Howard's lab. Okay, so what is the the features of adapt and I will not go into all of this. I'm just uh, quickly go over. It's a very flexible tool. It allows uh, to have multiple soil inputs, and it goes on a daily time step, daily uh, res uh, time step resolution. High resolution of climate data. It's a six hour lag, re almost real time of climate data and four by four kilometers uh, resolution in space, a spatial resolution. Um, the, opa, sorry, very flexible in terms of management inputs of the tillage uh, of the fertilizer input. It could be either uh, inorganic or organic like manure or cover crops uh, and, and, and many uh, different practices which are actually being uh, done on real fields. And very importantly, it allows input from the farmer. So if the farmer has measurements of soil N, it can uh, add it to the model and the model correct the estimates according to the uh, observations in the field. Um, so how does ADAPT N recommend N rates or what's the ADAPT N approach? It's a dynamic mass balance, mass balance approach. What it means that the nitrogen recommendation um, is, is dependent on the expected yield. The grower needs to, to, to supply what is a reasonable yield for that location. And then the model um, accounts for how much is already in the crop and how much is already in the soil. And these two components are simulated by the PNM model. Okay? And then it accounts for, for the, the previous crop uh, uh, credits, for example, soybean and future gains for mineralization for that soil type, for that location, or losses through weather. And another profit risk factor that uh, accounts for the, the prices of, of grain and fertilizer. It could be run either on a whole field, it could be run on a zone, it could be run in a fully gridded VRT, a high resolution variable rate uh, prescription, very um, uh, flexible. And, and, and in accommodating real life practices. Uh, the tool was independently validated now in, in many studies. I, I, I will just show a few of them. This is a, a study that uh, we had published two years ago in Agronomy Journal. It used strip trial data from 113 uh, trials uh, in New York and in Iowa. And in each trial, we had either uh, 
a rate recommended by ADAPT-N using our adaptive approach or by the grower uh, selected rate. And these are the results just to quickly walk you through. So this is the grower rate, ADAPT-N rate, and this is the one-to-one -one line. So if the data is higher or above this line, it means the grower rate is higher than the respective uh, ADAPT-N rate. And what we found that in 83% of the old trials, adapted actually allowed a reduction in, in, in an application. And quite significant, 45 kilograms per hectare, close to 35% reduction in, in fertilizer input. Uh, just note that there was few instances, few cases where adapted actually uh, recommended higher end rates than the grower in wetter season. And so it's not only reducing, it's, it's about adjusting the right end rate to the, to the specific location. And these are the, the yields. So practically, there is no difference in yields between the dynamic approach uh, and the static, uh, or basically the grower approach. And this means that the 34 or 35% of additional nitrogen supplied by grow is actually in excess. You can actually reduce that without uh, reducing your yield. And in fact, the yield is, if you look at the difference, it's not, it's not significant, but it is higher for Adapten because there are cases, like I said before, where Adapten recommended more nitrogen that led to much higher yield. And of course, if you reduce your N inputs and you don't reduce your yield, you increase your profit, and Adapten leads to an increase of $65 per hectare, which is a significant increase. And it just proved that there could be a win-win situation. You can actually um, apply less nitrogen and still make it more profitable for the farmer. What about the environmental losses? So this is simulated losses. This is not measured in all of those hundreds of trials. Um, so an average reduction of 36% in leaching losses and close to 40% in gases losses. So there's also a, a, a large in environmental benefit in using a tool like Adapt-N. Um, so there are many tools that are that promoted for US corn production, which are static, meaning they, for the same season, they recommend the same end rate, and, uh, regardless of the seasonal weather. And for New York, one such tool is, is the corn end calculator, which is called the, the CNC. It's a tool that was originally developed here at this department maybe 40 years ago. And historically, it's the tool that's been promoted for farmers uh, in the state of New York. So we wanted to compare our adaptive approach to this uh, static uh, tool. And we did it using multiple uh, N-rate trials. What is that? That's is trials where you have multiple N-rates where you have your, you collect the yield. And then it allows you to construct this curve. It's called the, the response curve. And you can actually calculate the optimum end rate for a specific season, for a specific field. And this is, of course, a perfect hindsight. Okay, So this is in the end of the season. You know what, in hindsight, was the optimum end rate. But it allows to then take uh, different tools like adapt or like the CNC and compare them using this data and see how do they perform. Uh, a few words about the, the CNC. It's a static tool. Basically, it's a factor which multiplies by, by the, uh, the yield and, and some correction for, for uh, the, the soil uh, and, and, and the efficiency of, of, of drainage in a location. Uh, and we compare it to that adaptive tool. So both of the tools rely on yield input. Okay, So this is very important. On, on the left here, what you can see that this is the achieved yield in the trials versus the, the estimated, the, the yields that were estimated by the growers. And we found that growers have a very good sense of what's the, 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 the potential of their field, okay? Uh, remarkable, actually, quite three, three bushels per acre difference. And if you use the, the, the actual default uh, yields in the database of the CNC, we found that it uh, underestimates the yield that we're measuring in the field. So, uh, and quite largely in about 60 uh, bushels per acre. And when you use these, these default uh, yields, which come with the CNC database, and you uh, use that to generate a recommendation, this is the, uh, the, the outcome. So this is the optimum end rate measured in each field. 
uh, and this is the recommendation. So this is for the default yield of the CMC. Basically, we found it to be under the, the optimum end rate because you have a low estimation of the yield, so that drives a low recommendation and uh, below the EONR or the optimum end rate, 40 pounds below. And if you take the measured yield or the estimated yields that's by the farmer, then you plug it into the calculator, we found that it actually overestimates the, the yield uh, excuse me, the, the EONR by close to 80 pounds per, per acre. So it's not just about correcting the yield input. And if we compare adapt N to the EONR, we found um, um, practically a, a better performance. It's a, an average six pounds below the optimum end rates, which is quite remarkable because just remember that, you know, these decisions regarding the end rates are are, are made in the beginning of the season. You don't know what will actually be, a, a, what, what will occur, you know, as the season progresses. And, 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 and the tool was able to, you know, when the EONR was, was, was low, the tool recommended lower end rates. And when the EONR is higher, the tool recommended more end rates. And overall, a, a nice correlation between end rates and the measured optimum. So this basically just supports that our adaptive approach is, is performs better than, than a, a static approach. Okay, so Adapten uh, competed in the Tulay Nitrogen Reduction Challenge. I don't know if you heard about it. It's, it's a challenge which uh, initiated by Tulane University and they uh, basically, called for, for teams from around the world to submit their solution to reduce, to reduce the nitrogen uh, uh, leaching from agricultural production uh, systems. And 77 teams sub, uh, applied their solution from around the world. It's a two, it was a two and a half year process and a, a committee of 16 experts uh, reviewed each tool and there were finalists that were invited to apply their tool on real production environments and real farms in Louisiana and demonstrate the tool. And uh, a month ago, two months ago, we were invited to New Orleans where we were told that Adaptin won the competition. Uh, so out of 77 teams, the, the, the committee found our, our solution to be a, a, a optimal and, and that was a, a really encouraging. There is a nice, um, prize associated with that that will go into further development of the tool. But more than that, it's the recognition that other people also see the potential of our tools, of the potential of this approach of, of a dynamically uh, estimating end rates. Uh, and that was, uh, of course, very encouraging. Okay, so in the few minutes that uh, I have, I want to just present how we use ADAPT then in environmental policies. And there are large companies like Walmart, but not only Walmart, large retail companies that, that want to reduce their, their carbon footprint. And Walmart, for example, came to the conclusion that fertilizer accounts for almost 50% of their carbon footprint. And they're looking to ways to, to basically track the sustainability of of their uh, of, of the production and 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 how they can uh, improve it, and we in in a paper just recently accepted to bioscience we we think that uh, an index called the N surplus or N balance is a suitable index for that, and and this, it's a very nice paper, uh, it's freely available in in the bioscience website, and so what is and surplus. It's a very simple index. It's N inputs, either by fertilizer or by manure or organic, other organic, eh, minus the amount of N which is removed by the crop. Okay, so the, the, what's left behind, the surplus, eh, this is the index. And there are many studies now that find that N surplus, when you increase N surplus, eh, for the, in, the, in the first stage, you have no increase in your yield scared losses. So basically, the fertilizer you, you, you add translates into higher yield, so there is, it's not lost to the environment. But there is a threshold in N surplus where further increase really drives uh, environmental losses uh, uh, increase. And 
the idea is that you can use this uh, sur uh, and surplus index to track uh, or, or, or to better uh, track the sustainability of your field. And I will show that here. We explored this in the bioscience paper using synthetic simulation. And um, we had five states in, in the, the five biggest pro corn production states in the United States, uh, in, in the Midwest. Um, three scenarios, fall pre-plant, where most of the corn is, a, most, of, most of that fertilizer is applied in the fall. Spring pre-plant, where most of the fertilizer is applied in the spring. And a split application where you have a modest starter in the beginning of the season, but most of the fertilizer is applied in season, okay? Uh, and we always use the adapt end to check if there is, there is any end deficiencies expected. And if there was, we added more end. So we eliminated any end deficiencies in all, all of our scenarios, all of our simulations. And this is the result. We found that there's a nice relationship between end surplus and yield scale end losses for our Midwest location. And what we also found that fall application here in the blue has a, a mean value of 175 kilogram and surplus value of 175 kilogram per hectare. And if you shift your application to the spring, the green here, you immediately reduce it quite substantially to 125 kilogram per hectare. And if you reduce it or you shift it further into the season, you can actually have a mean value of close to 30 kilograms per hectare. So there's a lot, a lot of improvement that can be done by shifting uh, the timing of your management uh, into in season. And, but we wanted to further explore what else can growers do to, to reduce their, their end surplus. So what I did, I, I used a field data. So this is experimental data, 127 trials that we had in seven US states. In every trial, we had either a rate uh, recommended by ADAPTEN, a dynamic approach versus a static approach. And what we found is that end surplus is also, of course, related to uh, the yield scale losses. It's much more noisier than the, our simulation results. But if we, and I'll add here the, the bean data, you can see that the, it starts to increase actually at about 75 uh, kilograms per hectare of end surplus value. But we wanted to really get a more quantitative estimation of this a, a threshold. So we, we did regressions, a hockey stick function, where basically there's a segment which is straight, which is connected to a linear increase, and the, the inflection point where n, where n losses begin to, to increase with n surplus is optimized. So what we found that we did it two times, first to the adaptive uh, data set and for the static data set separately. And what we found that about 48 kilograms per hectare, about 50, is a, a region where end losses really begin to increase in our experimental sites. So now we're taking this threshold and we went back to the data and compared the, the treatments. So here is the 48 kilogram of end surplus value. This is another value from the literature, 78 kilograms from a paper by Zhang uh, two or three years ago, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's a larger, so it's a more uh, relaxed and surplus uh, upper limit. And this is uh, what we found. This is the cumulative distribution, right? So of our, of our experimental uh, data. So when you use a static approach, only about 15% about of the time, you can actually meet that target of the, the, the 50 or 48 kilograms per, per uh, hectare of N surplus. And if you, use an adaptive approach, that's, uh, you have three times more likely to be within that region. It's close to 50% of the time you are within that uh, limit. And this got us thinking because, you know, if using a tool like ADAPT-N, which is mo one of the more advanced tools out there, even using a tool like ADAPT-N, only 50% of the times farmers are able to meet those, those regions of N surplus where end losses begin to increase. So what is realistic? What is a realistic value to expect for farmers? If you now want to go and, 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 and tell farmers to improve their, their management, you have to give them a realistic set of values. So we 
uh, extended the biostat simulation to include more uh, soil types. We added inhibitors. And similar to the, to the bioscience approach simulation, we always supplied enough N to eliminate any N deficiencies. And this is what we found. This is for a sandy loam, coarse loam, uh, coarse uh, soil in a dry location like Nebraska. And so if you use a fall application without inhibitors, you have about 30% of the time you're within the region that, or the 48 kilogram, uh, uh, let's say, target. Adding inhibitors improves the situation. You can bring more cases into that region. For a spring application, a further improvement. Adding inhibitors to a spring application, still another improvement. But the real improvement goes or happens when you move into the uh, split application and go in season and just supply fertilizer closer to when the, the, the crop actually uh, needs it. And in fact, just by shifting your management into in-season, it's very feasible to, to match those targets if you're in a dry location. So, so it, it can be done. But what happens if you're in a much wetter location, like Indiana? And so this is fall application without inhibitors. This is fall application with inhibitors, a great improvement, yeah? But I mean, it's just way off the target. I mean, and uh, spring without inhibitors and spring with inhibitors, better than the fall, but still a lot of the times you're not within the, the target region. And when you do the split application, it's of course the largest improvement, but still 60% of the time you can't make it or it's very hard for farmers to actually be within that, that region, uh, the target region. So what else can they do? What's, what are the options for greater efficiency? First of all, farmers can, there could be a trade-off between in the, uh, a farmer's profits and, and the environmental uh, aspects. You can do a modest yield reduction by not basically pressing the system so much. And I will, uh, the next slide, I will present that. You can have further optimization by a multiple N application throughout the season. Today they have high clearance equipment. Farmers can actually go two, three times within the season and almost spoon feed their crop with, with the nitrogen. So a much more efficient way of, of supplying uh, your nutrients. And you can have a greater use of, of, of cover crops. In our simulations here, uh, we found so the in many cases, there were a lot of residual so N in the soil in the end of the simulation. And this is here uh, highlighted in the red color. So the red is, is cases where the residual soil N is greater than 50 kilograms per hectare. Uh, and there's quite a lot of it. Not surprisingly, it's where the simulated yield losses are low. But this is just usually uh, soil N in the end of the season is prone to, to be lost during the winter or during the early spring. The, the next uh, uh, season. So if you, you can apply cover crops that can actually consume and, 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 and use this residual soil N. So if I, I want to go back again, this is the, the, or, or the response curve of, of you know, the N rate and yield. This is from 16 trials that we had in Indiana. And the, the, the black line is the mean value of all these experimental sites, and the green line is the optimum end rate calculated for this curve. And as you approach the, 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 the high end rates, the, the, the increase in yield, of course, diminishes, and it, it's less efficient. So you get less yield per nitrogen that you apply when you go to the, to the higher regions. And in fact, if you reduce just five bushels from that optimum end rate, which is about 2% of, of your yield, you reduce 16% of your N inputs. If you reduce 10 bushels, which is still only 5% reduction in yield, you reduce almost 30% of N inputs, okay? So what we, and this is, this is something we're we are now exploring. This can be translated into reduction in N surplus. So the five bushels reduction in yield is actually 30 kilograms per hectare reduction in end losses. And the farmers, of course, will need to be compensated for that. They're making 
a, a less profit. But so the compensation would be about $20 per hectare. If you reduce 10 bushels, it's about 50 or 45 uh, kilograms of end surplus reduction and about $60 compensation. And the idea is that you can now go into those locations where it's actually very prone to, to losses and, 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 and just maybe help shift the, the trials back into the region by not stressing the system so much and compensating the farmers for, for their uh, profit loss. Okay, so a few take home messages from this seminar. Adapt N allows reduction of N, apply, N application without reduction of yield. And, and it just proves that there could be a win-win situation where the farmer it increases its profit and, and there's less environmental pollution. We found a dynamic approach to be much better than a static approach in estimating N rates and it leads to, to higher profitability and lower environmental pollution. And a tool like ADAPT-N could be used to set standards to, of, of what is achievable and, and use efficiency or end surplus values for different production environments. And then policy makers can use these standards and, and think what are the practices, how, what, what practices can we promote that will help achieve those uh, standards or achieve those uh, targets. And, and perhaps they can shift the, the, the production environment into a more sustainable uh, production. Okay. Thank you. Uh, many people collaborated and helped, of course, along the years. Of course, Harold, uh, uh, Jeff, and, and Peter, uh, and, and many others. And of course, a lot of funding helped uh, along the way. And, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have. Um, thank you. So when you talk about inhibitor, do you mean the nitrification inhibitor? Yeah, so we did, we have adapt and can simulate multiple either uh, nitropyrene, like inhib a nitrification inhibitor, or a dual mode, like a urease inhibitor and a nitrification. So there's many it's, uh, inhibitors we, we do simulate. The data that I've presented is from nitropyrene, so that's a, a nitrification inhibitor. Yeah. So when you're doing your, um, your N equation, N in soil, that would be inorganic N. And then you have a, another figure that is um, N expected in the future. Does, it, yeah. does that data come from the region portion of the model that has some uh, microbial cycling in it? Is that how you're accounting for yeah, so for each, that will occur throughout So the for each site, we have in, in, the, in the estimation of N rates. Okay. So when you adapt and recommend, um, the end rate, so it's true that you have the, the simulated in, in the crop and an end by the PNN. There's also a component that accounts for future mineralization. So that's, so, so that's depending on, on the organic matter for the site specific. And it's based on long-term simulations for a similar soil type in the similar region. So what's, uh, yeah, so that's an expected sim contribution from mineralization for that soil type in that region. Sure. For the coming season, um, Howard is here to answer. Um, so kind of in a transition period, we, we feel like we've done a lot of validation. Uh, certainly in New York, we have five, six years of data in Iowa and uh, Indiana and so on. Uh, so, and right now, because uh, Yara International acquired the uh, license, um, we're uh, kind of initiating discussions with them of where, where they want to kind of go. We feel like for most of the U.S., we're, we're in a pretty good shape. Um, we're probably going to be looking more at maybe innovating our technology, trying to look at that. Um, and then Yara, of course, wants to expand um, to other geographies. So databases and all of that stuff. That's probably where we're going to go. So it, it, it's in a way, 
it's been a, a multi multi year effort and now at this point where um, where we have to kind of uh, you know work for this for the first time in the but we're also continuing some of the policy related stuff that's not really into the company necessarily as much as they although they should thank you other questions yes When you apply adapt and to like to Lucena, have you done any parameter um, tuning to to in the specific to that region? Yes, yeah, so so the soil type, the, the soil inputs uh, are are according for or are depending on the location. Yeah. Uh, I mean the parameters, the tuning type model, you said all the inputs. Yes, yeah, so you can't really calibrate the model for everywhere you, you apply it. It's been calibrated quite extensively in, in the Midwest and in the Northeast um, and in the Mid-Atlantic in, in uh, North Carolina. Um, so, you know, if, if, if we have better data for that location through a calibration study, we, we, we improve the, the coefficients. If not, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Howard, there's a, a, a default coefficient depending on the soil type and organic matter and, and USDA data, basically. Okay. Maybe I should add you know, it uses a lot of site specific information. So you know, we have a soil database in, in Mount Penn that, are, that relate to different regions in the country, like Louisiana, and sort of bringing in the, the weather in. But you know, it, it, it's an it, in a way an interesting uh, issue that we have because of the terrain uh, challenge that um, the industry reviews technology um, through our submission, and then we had to prove the technology on a farm actually in Louisiana, North Louisiana, and so we, even though we had we had the model available for that region, we hadn't really tested it, and so here you are. It's like the Olympics; you only get one shot. You know, to do it right. So, um, and, but we were very, very happy with the way it came out. The model did uh, did very well uh, under those conditions. So it's robust enough that um, that you know it can deal with different geographies, certainly in the U.S. The second question is about the uh, because this is like split application. So you have the weather information in your in your model, but it's very hard to do seasonal forecast for the weather. So when you run your simulation, um, how can you do like, what kind of like weather forecast data you use for your adaptation? Okay, so. Because say, yeah. if you want to update the A forecast? precipitation in three months, that is super hard. Of course. Of course. So the, the components that, that use the, the historical simulation, like the, the losses, this is the component here, the future mineralization, also temperature, you know, so it's very hard to predict what will be soil temperature in three months from now. So it's based on long-term simulation of historical data. Um, I know that uh, the, there is a feature that, that the company is, is working on where there'll be a, a short-term forecast, um, not months probably a few days or maybe a week, or I don't know exactly, but that will allow to also account for the near weather forecast when and if there's like for example, um, a rainfall or some uh, future immediate losses which are expected, so the end rate will be corrected to account for that. And this is a feature that they're working on now. It's not currently implemented in, in the model. Um, yeah. Relatively accurate in one week or yeah. two, but like the altitude is really hard, and seam of our forecast will be really, really hard. So if this year is like a really off year compared to your historical year, then the prediction might be affected. So that's my question. So if you use the like the weather data in the next two weeks, then your prediction, say for the next two weeks, might be okay. But you are targeting for the real one. Yeah, but we do, but we do account for that by those historical simulations. And of course, there's uncertainty. I mean, you do, I don't know, 20 or 30 years of simulation, 
uh, and you get uh, an expected season or with uncertainty you can in, you can account for that uncertainty or correct your estimation but it's it's historical it's true it's, it's a source of uncertainty in model prediction yeah any question yes please Um, so, so the model accounts for the hybrids that act, the, 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 the grower needs to, there's a long list of hybrids that, that the farmer uh, needs to, to or basically or supply which one is being used on that field. And then the parameters are tuned for that. Um, maybe Jeff can, can, can. And I'm aware of that, and I know there are some that are very, very, very different. There's great differences in those two different situations. But as far as I know, the seed companies have not made that a, a priority in the production of I'm not aware of that they have that as, I'm not aware of that as a position. I wish it was you who said it. It should be a pioneer that I can use to get this Certainly. There are situations where it would be very valuable to have hybrid that can take up more of the more efficient fraction of uh, depending on the situation. You could reduce, for example, when you're doing mice, either allow luxury consumption by the dog, although there are other issues related to that. But uh, so it's information that we don't currently use, not currently being used, but potentially could be. Anything. Could give us more information about the genetics of hybrids that would allow us to better simulate the growth of mice. That could be very valuable. It's just there's not, other than maturity dates, which is a lot of data. Oh, sorry. Now, there's, there's not much return on investment in the next investment in an underturned policy. Yeah. I'd like to uh, compliment the research team in producing a tool that's not just useful to farmers. I'm thinking of the groundworm that popped up in the Washington model 50 years ago. And it's got research progress and made contributions here and there, but generally I backed out of that for more specific uh, approaches on statistical things for crop simulation models because by the time we got them validated, what we were trying to convey to the practice of modeling what we had discovered. And, and the modeling at that stage was contributing to the development of the science that they could help the farmer. And I think we've done both. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to add to that. Thank you very much, Craig Gary. I, I have to add that we stand on the shoulders of uh, many of our colleagues in the United States, including some of our colleagues here in the department uh, who are either still here or I think it's, it's in that respect, it makes the research facility around uh, you know, teamwork and, and, and building building knowledge base. And every generation of research is built on what the previous generation has done. So we're very grateful for, for what other people have done as well. Any more questions? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.